Hey, it's Mazzy. Welcome back. I want to show uh, five archival releases, a couple of reissues, uh, five-ish, and you'll see why there's the ish here. Archival releases are, at least in this video, releases that have never been released. Uh, un tapes that have been discovered, recordings that have been unearthed. Sometimes there's outtakes or, or live shows that haven't seen the light of day commercially. Uh, sometimes we've had bootlegs of some of these, and some of these have never, never been heard before. And of course, reissues are simply that uh, in the world of vinyl. And before I jump into this, I do like to continue the promotion for Women in Vinyl, the organization, limited edition shirt, no longer available. But uh, uh, Google Women in Vinyl and uh, be a patron of the arts. They have a podcast and a uh, wonderful organization to get more women in the record vinyl industry from pressing plants to design to marketing, promotion, retail, but also in the making and creation of records. So I support them wholeheartedly. I want to start out with a record that I, I've been really enjoying over the last day or so, and that is uh, Lou Reed Archive Series Volume 1. Volume 1 means more volumes are going to come, I hope. I think that's what it's about. Light in the Attic is a Seattle-based record company that's put out some amazing reissues uh, and unreleased uh, records and archival records. Uh, they did a whole series of uh, of uh, the French uh, Ye Ye girl vocalist, uh, Francois Hardy. They've done the Serge Gainsbourg. Uh, they did a whole load of... Uh, uh, Lee Hazelwood, and I really kind of dove in. Some of those I missed, but I'm a fan of those records. Of course, Lee Hazelwood collaborated with Nancy Sinatra. And as a matter of fact, they've been uh, just started in the last year, a reissue campaign of Nancy and Lee and Nancy, Nancy alone, so on and so forth. But what I like about them, they have found this really uh, wonderful way to sell records to people uh, who don't know the title Some sometimes, especially if you have a record store near you and you can go flipping through the bins. There's a couple of record store in Seattle uh, where I've discovered them because they have a section of light in the attic. In fact, uh, KEXP, the great radio station in San Francisco, has a public space at Seattle Center, at the end of the monorail line, uh, where Climate Pledge Arena is, formerly Key Arena, and KEXP, the great uh, radio station, which you should listen to. And they actually have a pop-up semi-permanent, I guess, pop-up store that has a lot of their Light in the Attic titles, as well as some use and other uh, titles. And it's a great little place. Go get an espresso, cappuccino, macchiato, latte, cafe a la, whatever you want, and sit around, hang around. Sometimes there are live shows at KEXP there. But I digress, don't I? But this is a beautiful, um, first of all, I'm going to start from the outside and work my way in. Gorgeous package design. And this is designed by uh, Masaki Koeti, uh, who's a Japanese designer based in Los Angeles. I believe he teaches UCLA or USC in the design department there, but oh, beautiful design. But as I sidetrack myself, I do uh, mainly uh, many times, I really like that Light in the Attic has these obis that tell the story. And who's ever writing this stuff is brilliant. And it sold me on a bunch of their titles over the last several years. Uh, you kind of like, just think, oh God, I really need to get that. That sounds so delicious and it's, it must be wonderful. Uh, so this is the first, uh, I assume, of many. And what this is, I would say, this is a folk album. This is a demo album. This is a, a recording made in 1965. It, it was discovered on a five inch reel uh, tape. So a home 3M tape, scotch tape, I guess, uh, recording tape on from a home recorder that he recorded with John Cale in 1965. And of course it has some early versions, the earliest I think available of, I'm Waiting for the Man, Men of Good Fortune, Heroin. It's a different version of Men of Good Fortune, not the one you know uh, from later on Berlin, I believe. But it's really kind of cool to have this. Now, obviously it's a lo-fi recording, so if you can handle that, you should be all in on this. If you're a Lou Reed fanatic, this is a no-brainer. And I love that they carefully archive this uh, collection. Now, let me give you a, a little sh showcase here. A uh, beautiful uh, photograph. Uh, this is a photograph by Julian Schnabel, uh, the uh, amazing artist, also film director, 
who direct, I think his first film was Basquiat, about the, um, uh, the wonderful New York artist, made several other movies. And uh, this comes in, yes, for you audiophile types, <laughs> you have a, a polyline plastic sleeve, protects it from all those little shards that you hate uh, on the cardboard. Uh, this happens to be a yellow vinyl version. I don't know what variations they have, but I'm not necessarily a, vi a variation guy. There is also an expanded edition, which I believe is double 45 RBM and an extra single, I guess, or something. It's, it's expanded and bonus and uh, deluxe, I should say. But this is really wonderful. Uh, what uh, the designer did on the booklet obviously carries through with the yellow uh, interior and it goes through all the lyrics to every song. And what these are, this tape that they discovered was sealed uh, on a shelf behind Lou Reed's desk at his office uh, after he died. They carefully archived all these recording tapes and uh, CDs and things. And they found this one tape that was literally sealed in an envelope and it was mailed to himself when he lived uh, from his parents' house in Long Island. And it's called a poor man's copyright. And a lot of times, in fact, I remember doing that when I was young, mailing something to myself because I learned you could copyright something like that. True story for another time. But they found this tape and they carefully opened it later. The archivist went through it and they carefully found that this is a, a recording they hadn't heard before. They'd never heard this. And that's what this is all about. Carefully restored, archived, clean up. You can imagine a 50 plus, what, six, almost 60 year old tape has been carefully restored and put out in this uh, set. So if you're a fan of lo-fi folk music, primitive folk, uh, freak folk, I guess, this would be a great uh, introduction to you. And of course, this is two years before the Velvet Underground recorded uh, their album, um, the first one Andy Warhol uh, worked on. So Lou Reed, recommended, Light in the Attic. Check it out. And this is just a record that I've never seen. Uh, I didn't even know about on the original uh, incarnation of this record. To celebrate his 50th anniversary, because it originally came out, I think on Epic Records in 1971. I don't even remember seeing this record. And this is One Year by Colin Blundstone. Uh, Colin Blundstone, of course, was the amazing, beautiful, gorgeous vocalist for the zombies. She's not there. All the songs, Odyssey and Oracle, if you know that song. What a gorgeous, melodic uh, tenor. Tenor, is that right? High voice, but but so ethereal and so love, lovely voice. I didn't, you know, I've been around for a long time and I don't think I've ever seen this record. I recall seeing it. This is put out by Sunday's Records, uh, the great reissue label, uh, originally started by Bob Irwin, uh, who was a uh, staff producer, I believe, in A&R for uh, Columbia Records for years. And of course, Sunday's put all those great uh, Birds reissues, some Dylan Monos, uh, some really interesting things. Some Moby Grapes on and off, depending on the legal situation of uh, their infamous uh, ball buster wanker of a manager back in the day. But that is another story, too. I digress. I'd never heard this record. First of all, record one is so beautiful, very orchestrated. It, it, it probably was meant to be somewhat of a singer-songwriter record, but it's probably too beautiful for 1971 when the folk singing was happening. Obviously, we had Elton John and James Taylor. The Carol Kings were coming around. That, that whole singer-songwriter thing was really big in early uh, 1971, 70, 71, 72. I think this is just, it. people missed it. I missed it, and I was checking out a lot of records when I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, but it is a gorgeous record. Disc two, it is a double gatefold record, has great liner notes, and it has a sort of curation by uh, Colin Blundstone himself, as if he hasn't heard this record. It's recorded at Abbey Road Studios, so it's really well recorded. But that same year, so the first one's called One Year, the second disc is called That Same Year, and it's demos, alternate versions, kind of works in progress. You see him working out these songs, and there's a couple of really, really uh, gorgeous, gorgeous, just tear-jerk romantic songs. But this is such a beautiful record. 
I didn't expect much from this. So I put this on um, the first rainy day here we had in Seattle, and I literally played it three times straight through. It was that beautiful. And those of you who know my taste, you know what I'm talking about. Melodic, beautiful, gorgeous. I can say those words over and over again. It's not gonna make it any better than it is, but a really, a really well-recorded, well-pressed record. I did briefly mention this in another video, but since I'm doing this sort of archival reissue thing, this is another record I've been playing a lot in the last month. And this is from Kraft. And this is the Futuristic Sounds of Sun Ra, of course. Sun Ra, the orchestra. Uh, this was the first record uh, the arc, him and the orchestra recorded when they hit Manhattan. I believe they what left Chicago, went to Manhattan. They hooked up again with Tom Wilson, the great producer, who hooked him up with Savoy Records. And look at this very wonderful, like, 50s cover. This is, of course, 1961. So that kind of overlapping late 50s, early 60s, uh, almost, you know, very Salvador Dali ish there's so many sun raw records out and this is actually very accessible from my point of view it has that kind of crossover 50s 60s almost like a beatnik kind of far out record but not out there free jazz i don't see this as free jazz at all it's very accessible and really well recorded and this just you know this is a crankable record turn it up beautiful record i highly recommend it the Futuristic Sounds of Sun Ra, a craft reissue. I think you can get it. I don't know how limited it is, but uh, check it out. Really well, really um, high on my list this year. It's going to be in my favorite uh, reissue at the end of the year. I think I showed this just briefly before I listened to it because I've been excited about this. I had pre-ordered it. And this is put out by Disc Union, I believe. I got it through Stranded Records in San Francisco, uh, who has a, a store in San Francisco store in uh, Oakland and a store in uh, New York. And they do a lot of out there avant-garde, experimental, uh, free jazz, electronic, noise, industrial. And that is Yoko Ono. And this is uh, Yoko Ono Plastic Ono Super Band. Let's have a dream. As far as I know, this has never been released. And so this is truly an archival live recording at the One Step Festival in 1974 in Japan. I believe it's one of the first pop rock festivals ever in Japan. And this is very accessible. Uh, obviously, if you're not a Yoko fan, you're not going to go for it. But except for uh, Don't Work It, Kyoko, Mommy's Only Waiting for a Hand in the Sew that leads off side two. If you know that, you know what I'm talking about. It's still a driving, driving um, version of that song. But the rest of the songs are very accessible, very melodic. This was a, a, a time that she had a great sound. Now her band was uh, Steve Kahn on guitar, Andy Moosen on bass, Rick Morota and Steve Gadd. I don't know if they traded off on drums, but they're listed um, as drummers. And of course the Brecker brothers, Michael and Randy on uh, brass and sax and horns, trumpet, uh, back them up. So it's a really well-recorded record, of course. And again, the o Japanese obi. Get a little uh, taste, that's what the cover looks like. Uh, I really like this. I don't know how limited it is. It's a little difficult to get. You're probably not gonna find this uh, in your, your store. Check Light in the Attic, check um, Stranded, I guess, and uh, you might find it. But if you like Yoko Ono, it's a no-brainer. And it's very accessible and really well recorded. Yoko Ono, 1974. And lastly, God, these. I didn't know these were coming out being reissued. I have these on compact disc. I love these records. This is an interesting thing. This is the only artist I can think that released two records at once, Tom Waits, these two, and it's uh, Blood, Money, and Alice. Uh, these are from 2002 on Anti Records. And I remember Springsteen did it, remember? Was it Human Touch and the other one? And I know there's some other bands that have done it. I just, you know, someone's gonna, call me out on it. Of course, all the songs or most of the songs were written by Tom uh, Waits and Kathleen Brennan, his wife. The first one of the two is Alice. And I think this is my favorite of the two. Uh, this is music that most of the music was originally uh, written for an avant-garde theater piece written by, uh, put together, created by Robert Wilson, who does, um, I think he's most famous for collaborating with Philip Klass on Einstein on the Beach. And it's really good. Of course, it has that 
signature Tom Waits circus-like sound at times. Uh, there's some bluesy jazz a la um, uh, Bessie Smith a little bit in here in his own way, but it's a really well-recorded record. Uh, this is a, not a gatefold, but it's a two LP, not in the gatefold. And what I like about this too, let me talk about the artwork because one of my favorite photographers, photo illustrators, but it was Matt Maher and is Matt Maher, he's still alive. Uh, when I was uh, starting out as a photo agent and several of my photographers had a sort of conceptual side to it, I would see Matt Maherin's work all the time. And, and I would get calls because two of my photographers had this kind of ethereal style they were doing with Pol type 55 Polaroids and this kind of uh, wild, uh, moody black and white thing. And Matt Mahern would never do commercial work. He would direct videos. He did the Chase, uh, Tracy Chapman first album cover. You recognize his style here. You recognize his style here and there. He was a, a video director of a lot of music videos, including Peter Gabriel's uh, Mercy Street. I think he did uh, the Fast Car video by Tracy Chapman. He also did... Um, Enter Sandman by Metallica, as many others. He would not do commercial advertising work, but he would do editorial, record covers, and music videos. But what a great, a great artist. So uh, again, wait, musically, of course, it's the music, as I always say, but this is a beautiful package. I think he uh, art directed this whole package and design. And it's really well done. So of these, by the way, this is a two record set, because remember the original was on compact disc. And it's got sort of a, that color, a shit brandel. What do you call, no, it's more of a gold, goldish okra color. I don't know what the PMS color is. The other one here is um, Blood Money. And again, these came out the same day. I have a memory of the photo studio I worked at that I represented one of my photographers south of market. I remember seeing a billboard that had pictures from these two records. I never see billboards uh, in San Francisco of record covers, but I guess Auntie had a, a billboard when this came up, which is kind of cool. Let me talk about the package first since I talked about Matt Mahern on the other record. This one was also art directed and photographed by Jesse Dillon, son of Bob Dillon, who also uh, was a photographer and worked on a lot of videos and cinema. So a uh, beautiful package again, kind of a nice, Yin yang thing, a little different, but uh, let two artists sort of put these packages together. I love that. That's one of my favorite things about uh, the 12 inch format. I mean, these work so much better than the CD that I got at the time. This is very similar in a way. I think it's also uh, some of the work was uh, created by Robert Wilson too for a musical that Tom uh, Waits was working on as well uh, called Wojciak. Wojciak. I think that was the project that uh, Tom Waits uh, was creating. More Jesse Dillon photographs. Of course, it's got the lyrics, Kathleen Brennan mostly. And this one has, look at that, little custom label there. This is one of those videos where the music is a little off-center, off-kilter, which I think is really wonderful. Not that the Lou Reed stuff's off-kilter, but, you know, think about it, it's that... Uh, kind of, I want to say neo-folk. That's kind of bullshit, really, or proto-folk. I mean, he, a couple of tracks, he's right out of the Bob Dylan songbook in terms of style, or the Bob Dylan styling, I should say, with harmonica. But um, it's still kind of a cool, cool record. And I am looking forward to more in the series of the uh, of the Lou Reed archive. I know Laurie Anderson uh, had, was part of the project, pulling it all together. And of course, Yoko Ono and Sun Ra and Colin Blundstone's probably the most commercial of all the records I showed here. So enjoy the music. Enjoy the music, stupid. And uh, thanks for watching. Subscribe and all that good stuff. Mazzy loves you. Thank you.